Uh, good morning, everyone. Even though the legislature has adjourned and gone home, that doesn't mean our work in the executive branch has let up, nor has it for Ledge Council. Legislative lawyers will now go through the bills, as will the Senate Secretary and House Clerk, and then get signatures legislative le from legislative leadership before we start receiving bills, which will now come in large waves. We will then review them and decide how to act. I want to thank my general counsel, Jay Johnson, who goes through every single bill, line by line, word for word. She's one of the few in the entire process who actually does that. To put this all into perspective, a little over 100 bills were passed since January, 60 of them between Wednesday and Friday of just last week. About 40 were passed on the last day alone. In fact, some of the bills they passed aren't even posted yet, and that includes major bills with substantial amendments. So when we say we need to wait until we receive bills before making a final decision, this is why. Because the details and words matter, regardless of legislative intent or how it was described by the reporters of the bill. The end of the session is always hectic. But I don't remember another year when this many bills, with at least one of them with a 124-page amendment, jammed through in the final days. And I question whether those voting had enough time to read through them, much less consider all the ramifications. But as always, once we receive the final bills from the legislature, we will take the five days we're allowed to carefully consider what to do with them. As you know, which is often the case, there are parts of the bills we're fine with and parts we aren't. And so a lot of time is spent weighing the good versus the bad. So we'll do our part in considering the major flurry of bills at the very end. You can expect more letters than usual to point out our concerns and where lawmakers should make improvements when they return in June. And this may be the case whether the bills are signed go into law without signature or are vetoed. We only have about three bills in our possession right now and expect the remaining several dozen to roll in over the next few weeks. So with that, I'll open up to questions. You said you have three right now. Which three are those? That's a great question that I don't have the answer to. Um, I wonder if... Uh, so, I think a captive insurance bill Neonics and the pre op bill. Where do you stand on the Neonics bill? Again, trying to weigh all that out, uh, look at the details of the, of the bill. Um, I'm uh, generally supportive of it, uh, but I know that there are many, many concerns from farmers. So we'll take a look and see what the ramifications are of that. How about the prior authorization bill? Is that the one you mentioned? Um, again, a prior authorization is uh, in the same boat. I'm, I'm sympathetic uh, to uh, and spoke to many providers and hospitals and so forth, and uh, and I do. But we've heard from uh, insurance companies as well about their concerns about the increase in costs that could come as a result of this. Uh, the word "could" is important uh, because. Um, I would like to find a way, and I wish they'd included this in the bill, but we may have to, if we decide to move forward, we might have to include language somewhere to direct, like uh, Department of Financial Regulation, or ask the Greenmount Care Board to monitor this and actually track it. Uh, but, um, but again, those are the kind of the fine details uh, of the bill, and I wish they'd put that in the bill originally so we could track to see what the long-term effects are of this, uh, short and long-term, whether it costs more money or whether we save money by doing this. And I think there's a way to do it. Can you do that without vetoing the bill? I think so. Uh, it could, if I could. I mean, I can certainly direct our Department of Financial Regulation to do something. I can ask the Greenmont Care Board to do something. Um, and maybe the legislature could take it upon themselves in the next session to do something as well. But. I think it's important. I mean, obviously, uh, costs are important to me. 
rising inflation, um, the number of taxes that have been proposed and passed. I, um, this leads to the affordability of Vermont. So I don't want to impact that, but at the same time, um, maybe we can get both. We just have to, to understand the bill a little bit better. Governor, you expressed concern about a number of pieces of legislation, renewable energy standard, the taxes and things that you just mentioned. What were some of the bright spots? Like what, what was a, a bill or, or a proposal or a conversation that, that you really thought moved the state in a positive direction? You know, when, um, when we started the session, I talked a lot about housing being a priority, public safety being a priority, affordability <clears throat> being a priority. Um, I think we, we made some gains. We didn't get everything we wanted with public safety, and, um, but we got a ways. We got maybe two-thirds of what we had asked for, and uh, that was due to the great work of uh, Senator Sears and his committee. Uh, working with us on this and um, so I think it will provide us some tools and now it's going to be up to the judicial branch uh, the state's attorneys and so forth to utilize the tools that are going to be in place so I think that's one of the bright spots of this session you mentioned housing <clears throat> excuse me um, last time we asked you said it was a 50 50 chance everybody walks away how what do you think? I think the Act 250 yeah. bill was the one with the big amendment to it, but what, what are you making of, of what you're seeing so far? Yeah, it's still, you know, 50-50. Um, housing obviously is important to us. I think I told you early in the session uh, that my fear was that they would lump the two together and uh, force us to try or try and force us to do something uh, because housing was so important to us and all of them as well. Um, but we didn't just remember we didn't get everything we wanted with housing uh, it was a compromise from the start we would have liked to seen more in the bill but at the same time this was a tripartisan um, I think there was independents uh, progressives uh, Democrats and Republicans all on the bill signing on to the bill in both uh, bodies uh, when it all came to be uh, the only uh, out of the, the you know the substance of that bill came um, t through s311 uh, that never made it to the Senate floor uh, the body of that bill never even got a hearing in the House of Representatives and there was at least a third of the members who signed on to the bill which is fairly unusual so Again, we didn't get everything we wanted from the beginning on that, but it was a compromise from the start, and uh, we just have to weigh that out because I see the the negative effects of the conservation bill, the Act 250 uh, uh, conservation bill, uh, mixed in with the housing bill. The long-term effects on rural Vermont are my biggest concern. of house members signed on to 311 but it, it never even got a hearing in the house like you said do you think that speaks to a, a concentration of power among committee chairs I think there is a uh, you know there's a different style in every legislative session and uh, I think the the chairs do have a lot of power in the house in particular uh, not that they don't in the in the Senate uh, but um, but yeah I mean I, I've complained about uh, Act 250 reform for a number of years, and it always seems to be um, hit a roadblock, uh, so to speak, in two committees, and one in the House, one in the Senate, and by a, a relatively small number of people, even though I think the vast majority of people think they should have been reformed long before now. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of power there. Um, I know you don't have 687 yet, but it can you say one way or the other whether you plan to veto it at this point? The yield bill? Is that the yield bill? 687, which one's that? No, that's the Act 250, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the Act 250. Um, yeah, it's, it's again, it's 50 50. Um, we'll go through it and it's, um, you know, I sway one way and, or the other uh, because I know housing is so important to us and we need to make some gains right now uh, to help the economy, help our workforce. Uh, help our communities uh, but at what expense and if we're going to 
hurt the very uh, communities that we're going to help uh, in the short term and then in the long term hurt them, especially the rural parts of the state, is that worth it? And that's what you have to weigh out. Do you think it's a problem, the, the fact that, and it's not just in Vermont, but like this greater trend of combining bills into like mega bills that have like basically ride on each other, if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, I, that's, this isn't, I don't think it's a trend. I think it's been a, a trend for quite some time, uh, whether it's in, in Washington or it's in Montpelier. It's not the first I've seen this happen. It's unfortunate with this one uh, in particular because I think they should have been separate because we had so much momentum around housing. I think this was could have been one of those bright spots uh, that we talked about along with public safety. We could have put this package together. Again, us standing together with progressives and Democrats and Republicans alike all behind a single bill is almost unheard of. And uh, that would have been a great story to write. Last week you talked about um, coming up maybe with a new, uh, in terms of property taxes, a new deferral plan. Uh, is anything come of that? Are you going to make a presentation? Are you going to have a concrete proposal? Well, again, we have to determine what we're going to do with the bill, and I've already said that we'll probably veto it. Uh, I don't know what the House and the Senate will uh, decide to do. I mean, they can dig in and they can whip some votes, and and as they've shown us in the past, they don't need us. Uh, they can override vetoes uh, pretty handily. So uh, that could be their approach. Um, but if they're willing to, to look for a way to compromise, to, to come together, um, we're all ears. And, and we've got some ideas of our own. I'm not ready to talk about them at this point. When will you be? Uh, between now and June the 17th. So are you going to try to just read what their approach is, and if it seems like they want to override you, then yeah. not really negotiate with them? I don't think I'm going to read that. I think I'm going to ask them. And, uh, well, you know, I'll get together with a pro tem and the speaker. And when, when I was at the podium early Saturday morning, we had a, you know, we were talking a little bit um, at the podium, and, and um, she said, we should get together and talk about what's next. And I said, we should, yes. So, you know, we'll have the blunt conversation at some point soon, and um, then we'll go from there. At the same time, on Saturday evening, uh, I believe you announced that you're running for re-election. Um, how come? What, what, what's your thought process there? Um, well, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't know what I was going to do in some respects, but I thought it'd be irresponsible for me to walk away at this point in time. You know, we've made some gains over the first three terms, uh, six years. Uh, we prevented a lot of taxes and fees from from making Vermont more unaffordable than it is, and we made some gains there. But over the last two years, things have changed, and uh, and they changed dramatically. Uh, we, you know, I vetoed. Uh, the budget and some other bills last year, they overrode them, uh, imposed more taxes, uh, more fees, 20% increase in DMV fees alone, um, all kinds of things. And, uh, and I just think it's taking Vermont in the wrong direction. So uh, had they not done that, if we'd gone through another session where we had made some gains, uh, my decision might have been different. But um, I have a sense of responsibility. Um, to be honest, I, I could have gone either way, but uh, in the end, I thought, you know, we somebody needs to be um, somebody needs to be there uh, to be the voice of Vermonters. And right now, I think we're so out of balance in the legislature that we're not hearing from everyone. This weekend, as well, I understand for the first time, maybe in, in years, I think by, at least by my calculation, you'll be speaking at the GOP's spring banquet, spring luncheon. Um, this, uh, you're, this, it seems like this is the, one of the first times in a while you've engaged with your own party. Well, can you explain your your thinking behind that? Well, the, mainly uh, because Governor Burgum is coming. Uh, I uh, he, he and I came in to the uh, became governors at the same time. I developed a bit of a, a friendship with him. His wife, Catherine, 
uh, came to Vermont uh, to learn more about uh, our substance use disorder program and, and was very interested in what we had done and, and was hoping that we, she could glean some, uh, some from that to take back to North Dakota. Um, I find him to be uh, humble. Um, he's one uh, the, who I look to. I mean, he has a lot of ideas, smart guy. Uh, self-made uh, and comes from a rural state, grew up there as well. Um, but, um, and I look to for advice on energy. He has a lot of ideas on uh, carbon sequestration uh, that are interesting. And, um, but our two states are very, very different. We're at bookends. Uh, they're one of the top three um, most conservative states in the country. And we're probably at the top. Uh, in, top three in uh, the U.S. So uh, I, again, from the sentiments of our uh, representation, we're different, but, uh, but person to person, uh, he's, a, he's a good guy. And when he decided to run for governor, I was encouraged, or uh, run for president, I was encouraged. He, um, he along with Asa Hutchinson, governor, former governor, Nikki Haley, former governor, Chris Christie, former governor, and Doug Burgum. Um, I thought any one of them uh, being former governors who would make a, a, a good president. So I was supportive in that respect. As the last follow-up, uh, as you probably have seen, Governor Burgum was down in New York earlier this week in part defending former President Trump, who's on, on trial this week. Um, are, are you worried, or is it a concern of yours that this might this might alienate some 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 voters or supporters of yours, or that, that people might draw like a connection? I know you've. In part, well, you I know, think I, I've been very clear. It, you know, I'm I'm not a uh, Donald Trump supporter. I'm not supportive of his uh, candidacy. Um, regardless of who becomes vice president, uh, there uh, as a candidate. Um, I still won't be supportive. So even if my good friend Doug Burgum becomes a VP candidate, I won't be supportive of the ticket. Now that you've announced your reelection, you've talked in the past about for this next upcoming biennium, just getting some lawmakers with common sense or just fiscal moderation. So now that you've announced you're going to this event this weekend, which could you know maybe help somewhat with talking to people, but what do the plans look like heading into primaries in November to you know give you some of those more common sense State um, we're seeing a lot of interest uh, there. A lot of folks have reached out to us and not ready to sign on the bottom line, so to speak, uh, but have shown interest in becoming involved because they're, they're, they too are concerned about the direction of Vermont. And these aren't just Republicans. They're Democrats, um, independents uh, alike. So. We'll, um, we'll see over the next two or three weeks. It's, a, it's a quite a commitment uh, to make for some. Uh, but, um, but as I've said, you know, it was, a, it was a big leap for me when I first uh, announced I was going to run for the Senate, uh, not quite knowing what to expect and how it would affect my business. Uh, but, um, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that there would be more people stepping up. I, I was surprised to, to learn. I saw a list of uh, confirmed. House members not running. Uh, that um, I bet I, I'd say there must be at least a dozen Democrats not running, and a number of Republicans as well. So I think there is an opportunity there, and uh, we'll see what happens in the next two or three weeks. Could you see yourself supporting uh, what you describe as a moderate, pragmatic Democrat sure. in a primary with a more progressive Democrat? I I can see myself getting behind a pragmatic, conservative, moderate Democrat, yes. Um, whether I get involved in a primary, I'm not sure. You know, I, I try not to get involved in primaries uh, regardless, so I, I, don't, I don't know as I would get involved in that. As you're talking to candidates trying to recruit them, what would you say is, are the factors that make people unsure about running? Um, but it's just a time commitment. Uh, whether they, whether they could, uh, they could do it. Uh, whether they have the attributes, uh, they're concerned about, you know, the personal attacks, personal attacks on their families, and and you know, sometimes politics brings out the worst in people, 
and they're worried about the attacks on them and, and their families, which I understand that concern. folks on the phone. Start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business, Ma excuse me, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, I know politics is your favorite um, discussion point on these pressers. Um, I was talking with a, a prominent Republican senator, and he wanted you to expend some of your political capital being the, uh, I guess, second most popular governor in the nation, and his comment was, he only has to get 51% of the vote. Uh, and he was hoping, in fact, to pick up as many as five seats in the Senate. Is, is all that reasonable? Is that, is that part of your thinking here? Well, I, I think there could be a pickup in both the House and the Senate. How many, I don't know. How much of my political capital, um, so to speak, uh, has little to do with how I feel personally. Uh, you know, I've always been a moderate centrist, willing to work with the other side, um, trying to do whatever I can to help my constituents. Uh, none of that changes. I'm still a moderate centrist. So if, um, if that means uh, selling my soul, so to speak, just to get a Republican into place who I may not agree with, um, that wouldn't be worth it to me. It's not about party with me. It's about the person. And uh, again, that's why I've said just common sense, moderate centrists is what we need. We need uh, more people to work together and not just follow the herd. And so from my perspective, just working with them and trying to encourage uh, some of them, whether they be an independent, uh, Democrat, or Republican, I'm willing to do that. So if that means no. Using my, I mean, there'd be some who would say that that would be me supporting a Democrat, um, you know, an independent, like a Bobby Starr type of Democrat or a Dick Mazza type of Democrat. That might mean uh, I'm using up some of my political capital, but it might not be exactly what this senator had in mind that you're speaking of. Yeah, I'd have. The other thing I was I was thinking is if you're successful in a in a fifth term, you know the state just celebrated its 233rd um, anniversary. If I have my math right, I think you'd only be the third governor to get to five uh, through five elections. Did that have you have you thought about that at all? The, no. the sort of the history piece. No, uh, that hasn't entered into my. You know, I I go every uh, every biennium. I get through it and decide whether I'm going to run again. Um, it's not about, you know, how many terms I serve or don't serve. It's about how I can be more most effective and help the people of Vermont. Okay, thank you, Governor. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Uh, all right, back to the room. Governor, also, um, this week, Blue Cross Blue Shield MVP submitted double-digit rate hikes to the Green Mountain Care Board. I know this is in regulators' hands now, but what are your thoughts just on, on the direction of, of some of you know where, where healthcare policy is, is heading, and, and what's your sense of like how productive or how how much we got out of this session in terms of moving the needle on healthcare affordability? Yeah. Um it's a concern, obviously. Uh, this is going to impact uh, Vermonters, again, equal to a rise in property tax uh, rates, um, payroll tax, uh, as I said, DMV fees, all the above, just adding to the unaffordability of Vermont. And it says a lot about, again, our demographics that I've talked about a lot over the last uh, number of years since I was first elected. The older population with fewer younger people, fewer people in our workforce, the younger people and those younger uh, folks in the, in the workforce are what you typically would carry the load, so to speak, in the insurance uh, atmosphere for health insurance. We have more people over the age of 65 now than we probably ever have. And uh, that leads to more usage of our healthcare system. So, 
that adds to it. So it's just the reality that we have to face. So we have to keep focusing on more housing, bringing more people in, uh, attracting more people to come to our state. And I don't think it's by raising taxes. I mean, that's not a great message campaign to attract more people to Vermont, come to Vermont, pay more taxes. That doesn't, that doesn't seem to work. This, I'm told this is going to hit small group uh, insurance pool, like small businesses, especially hard. Is there anything that, that the state can do to, to blunt? I mean, I know it's not like the property tax issue, but is there anything that the state can do to blunt or to provide relief for, well, for health insurance? Well, again, we'll let the Greenmount Care Board um, take a look at this. We'll have our Department of Financial Regulation take a look and see if there's anything we're doing that is is adding to this cost uh, where we could help reduce it. So we'll be looking at that side. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, the Climate Square Fund Act? Um, we'll, we'll be weighing that one out uh, as well. Uh, my initial thoughts haven't changed. I think we're, you know, we're struggling as a state financially. Um, last we, thing we need is to take on someone who has, to be blunt, many, much more financial resources than Vermont does, and take them on. My concern is the costs associated with this. And uh, coupled with that is we could be an easy mark in some respects uh, for uh, these big oil companies who will just outlast us because they have the resources to do that. And if we fail, if, we, if we're the only one, and we're going to be going up against big oil, they could actually use us if they defeat us and use it as precedent in other cases that might come along. So I think we better be cautious about this, um, and we'll weigh that out um, as we're looking for it. I'm not, I'm not opposed to, I mean, there's been a number of initiatives over the years. I think GMO was one that was, uh, we fought against, spent a lot of money and, and failed on. Uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, succeed. And we could spend a lot of money here, uh, at least from my layman's position, uh, would be led to believe. So we'll weigh that out and see what happens. But, uh, but I'm concerned about the costs associated with this. And I will, you know, if we do move forward, I think uh, the Attorney General has said that they could do this within existing resources. I mean, if that's what they're going to do, that's what they're, what they're going to do. But we don't have any extra money to put into this, not the hundreds of millions of dollars it might take. What about uh, H-626 uh, animal welfare? I haven't looked at that one yet, but we'll look at that. When it comes. If we go back to the yield bill really quick. So just yes or no, are you planning on vetoing it? I'm planning on vetoing it. Okay. What what specifically would need to change about it in order for I mean not that they're gonna make changes now, but when they come back on June seventeenth, what are you looking for specifically? A reduction in rates. To four percent? Well something four. less than I mean they I was ready to, to veto the bill at 12 and a half percent. And then the, that was what was passed out of the Senate. And then, uh, then they negotiated with the House and they were successful in getting it up to 13.8, almost 14. So that's moving in the wrong direction. So from my standpoint, the double digit increase is just too much for people to withstand especially facing health care costs, uh, increasing costs, taxes and fees and so forth. The combined amount is just more than the average Vermonter, especially seniors living on fixed incomes and so forth, can endure. And, and I know there's income sensitivity, but you keep it growing that population and somebody still has to pay the bill. It just gets that much more expensive for I think the very people we're trying to protect. Did you ever think, I know that 
you have criticized the legislature for implementing this with an 18 month long study on, and saying that that's too long of a time for them to take on this. But did you ever think it was possible to do like a major structural overhaul of our ed financing system in one legislative session? Yes. You did? I did. Okay. Yeah. I think we were getting close to that when we had some negotiations with a few people or, or just brainstorming with a small group during the early parts of the session. And I, when the House uh, came out and, and, uh, and talked about that, uh, and then I was encouraged because there was a lot of opportunity with what they had proposed. Uh, but then they pulled it back within, you know, 24 hours and uh, decided to turn it into a long-term study and so forth. So, again, I think it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but I think it could have been accomplished. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it can now, but I think it you, could have been. You're, you're referring to the bill from Representative Beck that would have provided some sort of state allocation or state funding for districts, and then if they go over that, they would have to generate the... Well, there was... There was there was some, I think it was the House, I don't know if the Speaker was involved uh, with that, but there was a group, I think they had a press conference on it um, mm -hmm. when they rolled out uh, their plan for the yield. So I think maybe Representative Beck was part of that, but I, I think this might have been before that, but it could have been all one piece. I just don't know. Is that what you see as a possible solution now? I'm not sure that it is right now at this juncture, um, but um, but it could be in the future. I think what we need to do is we need to take a look at some of the the ways we can, and we have some ideas on how to do that. Our commissioner of taxes uh, has uh, testified in the House and Senate about those very provisions, but we have a few other ideas as well, and maybe they do too. But but they have to be willing, right? Because if they're not. If they're just going to push this through and uh, just push for votes and override the veto, you know, it may be a waste of time because they'll know whether they have the votes. So I'm just a little confused. What are you looking for in the short term here? I'm looking for reduced rates, property tax rates. But we may not be able to do it um, all at once like we were, we were thinking at the early on in the session and what we were working on behind the scenes with the House and the Senate. Um, Again, they pulled back on that initiative pretty quick once they rolled it out. So I, but I, that would have been the opportunity to move forward. If you think that a big structural change was possible this year, why, why do you think the legislature didn't do it? I know you can't read their mind, but... No, I, I mean, I think they received tremendous pushback from their supporters their support groups and so they decided to not move forward that's what I'm surmising um, Barry just voted down its school budget again yesterday Have you followed that? I didn't see that no but I knew that they were voting yeah, yeah. any thoughts on, on that? well it just shows the discontent that we still have out there with the rate of property tax increases. This is going to affect a lot of people. And we knew it was coming. Showed, we, we proved that. We, sh we showed what was going to happen in the December 1st letter. And they didn't take it seriously. There's also the data privacy bill, H-121, which got a very big amendment on the last day, right before it got shoved through. But overall, what are you thinking on that? Again, that's one of those we're going to have to weigh out. Um, I'm still concerned about small businesses in Vermont uh, that are saying this will have an adverse effect on our business. Now, whether the amendment fixed that or not, I don't know. We haven't spoken to them, but um, but I'm worried about that. Yeah. They did really increase the, the, I forget the number off the top of my head and it changed, but they did increase the uh, number of customers served that 
would apply for the law. Yeah, so. just don't want to make this too complicated so that small businesses have enough to take care of um, without adding uh, to their their burden. They're going to have hard enough time figuring out how to pay their property taxes because they aren't income sensitized and. And when you think about that, it, the non-residential rate is, is much higher than, than the 13.8. And that is going to impact those who rent as well. So they don't get income sensitized at that point. I know we just finished this legislative session, but what do you think, if you win re-election in the fall, what do you think are gonna be your high points next year? I, I, I'm probably known for my consistency. I'm not sure that they were going to be uh, much different. Mm -hmm. Affordability is still a problem here in this state. We still need more people. We still need more housing. We need all the things we've been talking about over the last number of years. Uh, that hasn't changed. So we need to stick to the fundamentals. We need to follow through. Uh, we don't need a new initiative, shiny new object uh, falling from the sky to focus on, take our eyes off from the true structural problems that we face. Thank you all. Thank you.